Welcome to the Mirror Talks podcast, where we deconstruct some of humanity's most disconnecting and limiting assumptions and offer an alternative, a free state of consciousness, unbiased, naturally wise, and genuinely loving. We will shed a more enlightened perspective on everyday experiences to help anyone willing realize their true potential and inspire a contemporary spiritual life lift in service to all. Say goodbye to the man-made paradigms of distorted ideas. Let's become pure, free, and actually intelligent once again. Hello, everyone. This episode is called The Paradox of Electing Remarkable Leaders, and it's a Mirror Talks bonus episode. We're including it as a bonus because it was an unplanned, casual conversation that we didn't intend to use at the time. But then we found it to be a compelling enough exploration with some interesting hypotheses about how to get the most competent leaders into leadership roles, and then how to hold them accountable once they are in those roles. When what qualifies them as remarkable in the first place is invisible to most. So you can expect the pace to be a little slow and the teachings to be less conclusive than usual, but it's a fun, thought-provoking conversation. Enjoy. Just posted on my Instagram story. The secret is to care about people without caring about what they think. Oh yeah, I saw that. That's good. Nice. I like it. And are they um, mutually exclusive? Caring about people and caring about what they think. Oh, nice. Like you can't care about people if you care about what they think. Well, that's the question. That's cool. Um, well, you can't do both as equally as much, is what I'm saying. So the less you care about what people think, the more you can care about them. Right. Or the more you care about them, the more you'll sacrifice your fear for what they think. Right? Let's say you're in need of something. Uh, but me providing you with that need or with that service or whatever it is, somehow uh, that's an action that's going to make me look really bad. And people are going to think bad of me. Or maybe even you. Maybe you, for some reason, are even going to think badly of me. But I know 100% sure, not out of ego or anything, but somehow you need something and somehow that's super clear to me. I know you're not going to like me for it or other people are not going to like me for it. If I really care about you, what would I do, right? Wow. I mean, it's not rocket science, but what? Um, it actually sounds like parenting. Exactly like parenting, right? Let's just think about that earlier. Um, how, like when you're talking to people these days, it's, uh, there's, uh, depending on where you come from, but if you've done a lot of the inner work, you'll notice very quickly that a lot of people just unconsciously roam around their lives, mm -hmm. bouncing from thought to thought. And so it is like interacting with children, children in a way, because uh, they don't know the ways of consciousness. They don't know the ways of true integrity, true sincerity. They think they do, and some people do. Of course, there's exceptions. But for the most part, even though people have really good hearts and they mean really well, there are so many layers of unconscious assumption and unconscious self-driven motivation, self-centered motivation, self-protection motivation, mm -hmm. um, self-validation motivation, and so many layers of insecurity and self-service. Not intentionally, but it is there. And so it's distorting the goodness of their heart. It's distorting the freedom and the generosity with which they otherwise could skillfully express their service to others. So in a sense, it's like dealing with kids once you get beyond that level yourself. Um, and then it's like you're not always going to give them what they want. You're not always going to display or say or do or demonstrate what it is that they want from their state of consciousness, even if it's in their best interest. Just like, uh, and they may not like you for it, is kind of the point. Uh, just like a kid will not like you for a little while if uh, you take away its ice cream, because right. it's already third ice cream that day, right? And it's time for broccoli. 
It's like, that's not love, right? Like to continue to let the child do whatever it thinks it wants. But it, it may believe in its sort of uh, immature state, it may believe that that is love. Like if it gets what it wants, it feels pleasurable, or it feels good, or it feels comfortable, or it feels validated. But, um, you know, as a parent, when you see beyond that face value, obvious level of the service, and you see a little deeper, you know that it's not very loving to let your child eat whatever it wants to eat, because you care about its future, you care about its well being, you care about it growing up in a proper state to where it can make its own free choices and not have um, uh, an obese body or not be, you know, uh, overweight already by the time that they are ready to make their own choices. And by then they're already um, habituated in a certain way. And they already have picked up bad habits, which at no fault of their own, because they're just begging for the candy because it tastes mm -hmm. good. They don't know any better. So it's not a very loving act to just want to mutually sort of validate each other because the parent, if they get the response from the child, like, uh, I don't like this. And why can't I eat what I want? If the parent is super insecure, then they will feel unloved. Then they will feel like, Oh, I'm a bad person or, uh, my child doesn't like me. And I don't, I can't handle that. So you, of course, here you go, honey, like an extreme example. And whereas the parent who says, Nope, it's been enough. No more discussion. That's it. Here, eat your broccoli. Uh, the child will respond in a way that an insecure parent with an insecure self esteem and self image uh, will not enjoy, because it threatens their sense of being loved and, and uh, being a nice person and being validated and so forth. And they don't want to sacrifice their child not liking them because mm -hmm. and so forth. But um, I guess the distinction then is everybody gets that with kids with parenting. But when you apply that to a bunch of adults across the world, how do you sort of distinguish that hierarchy of wisdom? Uh, you can't and that's a great topic. Uh, they can't. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there's this whole at, at one point, I wrote this list of paradoxes to resolve one day and they're relative paradoxes. They're not uh, absolute paradoxes They they don't have to do with the paradoxes that I deal with when it comes to resolving certain complex spiritual matters or like practices or stages of the path. But um, let me see if I can find it. This was about leadership. So here's some thoughts I wrote out at some point. This is like a year ago. Fundamental leadership slash governmental paradoxes to resolve into formulas that work and honor the exceptions, the paradoxes, and so forth. The rules and agreements of what is right are not always best, for they, having become static equations, cannot likely apply to each and every case. Thus, in times where the rules seem to fall short in their comprehension of what is needed, what is right, when to trust the intuitive or logical right thing to do, when it seems opposite to the rules or formulas set forth or written down for the masses, and for the general circumstances. Who to trust with handling the exceptions, and who to trust with the knowledge to do what is right in times when that action seems to oppose, or perhaps actually opposes, the inherent limitation in the reach slash comprehension of the rules. And how to communicate that this exception to the rules was, indeed, a just choice to those who do not have this comprehension and might take this as an indication of corruption in the leader, or as a permission slip to themselves act free from the rules and agreements set forth, even when they do not possess the proper wisdom to act outside of the rules and still stay within an acceptable range of justness. It seems that without leadership, we are doomed to head for the cliff, unaware of our destination. So then, the right leadership being required, what is the best and fairest or most just and beneficial for all way to elect such leadership? How does the not better man recognize the better man and thus enable to elect wisely? 
Is it not the wise leader that sees what is needed and missing, and he or she alone can decide to elect themselves? And if the leader who recognizes just leadership within himself or potentially in another, how to make the public accept this choice which they did not make? How to put the leader actually worthy of leading, recognized only by the worthy leaders, in a position of influence, in front of an audience that is likely unable to recognize the worthiness to lead in the self-appointed or appointed by worthy peers leader. How to solve this paradox. Here's okay. another paradox to resolve in formulaic writing eventually. Assuming the right leader has been accepted and was truly the right choice at the time of the election, how to ensure that this leader remains the right leader? How to tell when this leader is no longer the best leader? And what procedures should follow to determine this in acceptable fashion? And what safety switches should be in place in case the leader faults slash loses his right mind? When to trust the leader when his decisions seem perhaps to not be coming from a space of being in the right mind? And how to determine whether his vision trumps that of his peers and thus may seem to be deficient, but might actually be the right thing coming from the right mind? Mm. And that being the very reason why he was elected or she was elected as the leader. Because he or she can see things that others can, therefore being more worthy of being leadership position. How can a not worthy leader, not worthy leader, determine the state of mind of the worthy leader? That's the paradox. How to create a following that is not blind, yet has faith in the right thing, which often lies beyond its own immediate comprehension good for concentration and sincerity purpose, building purposes alike, both of which have a strong correlation, by the way. For is the insincere or selfish person not short in their attention span, low on patience and lack of focus, and the sincere or selfless long in their attention span? Which brings me to another paradox, or rather supposition to be proven right or wrong. But as part of the same process of discovering what is needed, to generate a thriving, happy, harmonious kingdom or world. Is there a direct correlation between attention span slash patience and sincerity or justness? How to bring the resolve resulting from a long, deep intellectual inquiry to those with less attention span or intellectual capacity? How to make them understand what is just and closer in accordance with law of one and what is of greater distortion? Do you remember what you were saying about the paradox of leadership? Yeah, like the, or? the hierarchy of, like, I think it's exactly what you pointed to, which is how do you, like, how do you design a system where the most worthy leader it gets put in a leadership position, even if what qualifies them is invisible to the people who are not the worthy leaders? And I love that you pointed out the, and how do we put safety measures in place if people can't even understand, if people can't even see what makes this person a worthy leader in the first place. Right. Yeah. So two main paradoxes to elect leadership. Like if we're, if we're just talking about leaders that represent or supposedly represent a large percentage of the population, like we've been doing that for ages and democracy, w whatever, we can continue to do that. Classical democracy. Yeah. But maybe there's an alternative form of democracy where, anyway, what I'm hinting at is that there are remarkable leaders out there that are unseen, that are unknown, and who are truly remarkable, like truly intelligent, and truly have, not only does it take remarkable intelligence and out-of-the-box thinking and high IQ and all that, it perhaps most of all requires... Um, someone to have, again, gutted their own ego, like emptied out their own ego to the degree where their natural response is actually that of love, is actually that of inseparability between others and themselves. And they have almost no interest in leadership. Um, or if they do, it really is for that reason. And it's a natural thing. It's not because they want to be in leadership position to validate themselves or their insecurities or to massage themselves or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. but let's say, and I'm confident that there are remarkable leaders out there that we don't know about that would be leagues above 
the leaders that we've seen publicly being elected for the most part, like truly remarkable leaders. Um, so let's say that uh, a person like that exists or is even, let's say they're in the election round. So the first paradox then is to, because first of all, that if you think about a truly remarkable leader, someone who could truly do good for the benefit of all, like who could truly make a civilization or a nation or whatever it is, a kingdom, excel. Let's say that's the desire of the people. Let's say they're all sort of in their right minds and they want the best for all. They really want the best for all. And it's like, and they want to quantum leap from where they're at to where they're going to be next generation or like even in five to 10 years. In order to establish that, you would need a remarkable leader and you would need a, a system that somehow supports that remarkable leadership and that vision. So by definition, if you want to quantum leap like that and you, and you want to take your civilization or kingdom or nation or whatever it is, community, truly to its next level for the benefit of all, and let's say that hypothetically there is someone who is up for that task, who is equipped for that job, then the immediate paradox is the reason that they would be the one to lead is because they see more, understand more, have greater vision, inside, balanced view, and purer intent. They can see beyond their own bubble, where the majority, the vast majority of the people that would be in a position to elect such a remarkable leader would not have that capacity. And this is kind of a stalemate, like a checkmate. How do you, how do you have uh, a group of people who does not have that vision or intelligence or enlightenment or remarkable leadership uh, blueprint. How does a group like that recognize remarkable leadership, first of all? Because if they could recognize it, they could lead themselves. By mm -hmm. definition, if we're talking about a civilization that needs leadership, that can't take itself to the next level in any short amount of time, but they really want to, that's their vote in their hearts. They want to take their civilization to the next level for the benefit of all. By definition, the reason they can't do it themselves is because they lack the vision and the leadership as individuals, at least. I'm sure there's a few, but on um, on the overall scale, the population or the nation or the community, that skill is lacking. By definition, you would then need someone who sees more than you, who understands more than you, who sees farther than you do, who can calculate the implications of certain actions and 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 responses and choices. Um, or, or multiple, if we're talking about a group of leaders somehow, or like a council or like some kind of a, whatever structure you want to name that. So by definition, if such a quantum leap is possible and the people want it, by definition, it means that they would have to elect a leadership that they cannot recognize the validity of. Right. I, I find that a fascinating problem uh, to try to solve. Like how, how would you solve that? there'd be a few people in the audience that would recognize it, mm -hmm. but it really does take one to know one. So let's say this leader exists. How would you get the masses to accept what's in their best interest, which would be the election of this particular remarkable leader? It's a tough one. Well, it's cool if it was the intention of a civilization to quantum leap, then at least we could start with, with we could open our minds to this discussion at least. Right. Like what would it, how could we identify this person that, like if we could at least humble ourselves to that question, mm -hmm. like how can we find this person that we probably can't even recognize yet, mm -hmm. hypothetically to run a couple experiments, like maybe, yeah, take, I don't know, take nominations. So what, you said you've already thought about this. What have you come up with? No, I, I haven't solved it. It's a paradox, a relative paradox, not an absolute paradox, but it's a paradox that applies to our relative um, situation. I just find it like it always makes me giggle because it is an unsolved uh, puzzle. I mean, there's certain ways you can think of, but by definition, it's almost like not meant to be solved. It's just meant to be your Cohen kind of thing. How does one who wants to excel but can't because they lack certain qualities, in this case, leadership, 
self-leadership, leadership of groups, whatever. Same thing, really. How can someone who can't take themselves from A to B in the way that they want to recognize someone who can take them from A to B? Um, and then we're, we're really talking about the, the topic also of like trust, like how much faith do you put in someone else? which is another sort of topic, but it's uh, definitely directly related to this. Well, why isn't it more obvious, though? Because I can think like if I wanted to get really good at piano, it would be effortless for me to figure out who I should look at. You just find somebody who's clearly good at piano, you listen to them play once, and it's like, all right, I want to learn from that person. I agree. That would mean that this leader somehow would have had already been in a position of leadership long enough to demonstrate its quality his or her quality. Then based on the proof, based on the confirmation, you can say, oh, okay, well, let's trust in this being because look at everything that he or she was able to resolve for the benefit of all. And but that would take time, that would take years for those results to be recognized by the masses. Because also, especially in a civilization like Earth, you're not going to please everyone right away, regardless of what you do. Let's say you are a remarkable leader and we have elected a remarkable leader uh, as our president. You're not going to recognize, um, you're not going to recognize the initial years, these things, because these types of things, they're complex dynamics, right? And this is why you would need a remarkable leader to help guide and resolve these things. Mm. Therefore, to even see the results would take many years alone. But that already assumes that this person was already elected or already had been given the trust of whatever crowd it has been elected to lead. So how do you how how do you choose the right person when you don't have that which it takes to recognize it? Which is why you would want to select that as your leader if you're humble enough. Like, oh, I can't I I couldn't for the life of me figure out this math problem. By all means, math teacher, help me out. So similarly with leadership, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how to regenerate this community or this nation or this world. And because I can, but I want to, I have to, in, in some way, shape or form, to some degree, I have to accept someone else's leadership, someone else's superiority in a particular field of leadership in this case, but it could be any topic. So... But how do I do that? And especially when we're talking about leadership, when there is sort of the illusion of giving some of your power away, which is never true, it's never truly the case, but it's the illusion of like, okay, we're trusting in this, uh, in this being or this group of beings, whatever it is. But again, how do you recognize which one to elect? Because the reason you want to elect that particular person is because you don't have those skills or you don't have that ability. Therefore, if you want them to assist you in the best possible outcome. You have to trust something that you cannot recognize because you don't have it yourself. And then when, let's say hypothetically, such an entity or group of entities is elected and they are trusted with that sort of organizational leadership overview, decision-making at top level of the society, how does what would be sort of a law, if you, if you will, to uh, prevent those leaders or that leader from turning into a selfish dictator. Because again, you are trusting them, right? Mm -hmm. Initially, you say like, okay, we're trusting this leader. Because we believe that this leader can do a better job than we can. And they can mm -hmm. see stuff that we can't and see. And that they can, exactly. And that they can see stuff that we can't. So now I'm trusting this leader. Because I want the best for all. And I believe that this leader or group of leaders sees more than I see, or has somehow a greater ability to see the overview or whatever it takes to accomplish what we want to accomplish as a civilization or nation. But now they are elected. Now they have my vote that they have our trust. And maybe for a few years, they're like beginning to produce some really good results. But how do you know if you can't recognize, because some of the decisions that have led to really positive outcomes, if they are truly remarkable leaders, will have taken place through unconventional means mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. time to time anyway I mean, not all the way all the time but sometimes because they see something you don't see they will choose a path that 
baffles you. Then everybody's just like, no, 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 What? no. And yeah, then it yeah. goes it's not right. logical. And then it goes right. So let's say that happens a few times or a few years in a row. But how do you then, because you can't recognize where the truly remarkable leader comes from, but they're producing results and they seem to understand certain things that we don't. So now that they have our trust, what are the, uh, uh, what do you call that? Fail safe? Yeah. Switches kind of thing right. mm -hmm. to prevent, like how do, how would we recognize mm -hmm. if such a being either becomes secretly selfish or um, somehow kind of loses their mind or gets overwhelmed or imbalanced or no longer is aligned enough, whether it's through overwhelm, through critique, through personal circumstances, through physical health, mental, whatever it is, psychic attacks. Let's say that that person no longer is that remarkable leader. How would you recognize it if they've performed so well against what was conventional? So you trusted them over time because they proved that mm -hmm. sometimes the un unconventional thing to do actually delivered the results. And now they're about to do something really unconventional. How would you, how to maintain, uh, how to make sure that those who are in leadership maintain a true ability to be that remarkable leader. And that Even when, when it's all out of your league. Right. And that if, how, how to make sure that if they somehow fall off their alignment or fall, fall off of their um, ability to be that remarkable leader, that somehow the system or the law or something would be able to recognize that and what would be to feel, uh, the feel safe. So what's, what do you think? I, I haven't really thought about it that much. Just, I just enjoyed the paradox. Um, so I don't know. Like so, if you had to design of the system right now from scratch, well, best well, case first, scenario. First, we'd have to, uh, we'd have to solve the first paradox. How do you get somebody <laughs> elected without turning into dictatorship, without it becoming self-election? It, it's almost, it almost seems impossible. It is possible, but how? again, hmm. the leader who is the remarkable leader knows that they're the remarkable leader, knows that they see things other people can't. First of all. Hang on one second on that, because there are so many people who are going to hear that statement and be like, yes, I am one of them. Like there's so many people who really aren't, exactly. but who believe that they are, who know that they are. Okay. So good point. There, well, there's a lot of people that think that they are, but I'm saying the truly remarkable leader actually knows that they are. So it might seem like the same thing, but the remarkable leader will know. And, may, and maybe the one that's not the remarkable leader also thinks that they know. So there's another sort of challenge for you. Uh, but what I'm saying, regardless of that, I'm saying that the truly remarkable leader, without any pride, but they would know that they would be able to handle a certain kind of situation or position of leadership. Someone who sees more than someone else sees knows that they see more than someone else sees. I'm not saying there's not a lot of people who think they see more than other people see. And to them, it feels like they know also. Yes. Um, but it's similar to how, again, to how a parent sees more, understands more of the oncoming traffic and the traffic rules than the child that's about to follow a butterfly onto the highway because the parent's been experienced in that field and has insight. So in that sense, the parent knows for sure that they know more about the traffic situation than the child does. So therefore they know that they're in the proper place to lead the child when it comes to a traffic situation. Now the child may know much more about all kinds of other stuff. Um, we can learn a lot from that child or that parent can learn a lot from that child. But in the case of the traffic situation, the parent knows for sure that the child does not know what the parent knows. For sure, 100%. I'm not saying there's not a lot of other kids that think that they know more than that kid does about traffic, which may or may not be true. But again, doesn't negate the fact that the parent in that situation knows for sure that they're the one to lead or that they, at least they could and they can and they, because they know better than the child does when it comes to that topic. It doesn't mean they're more valid. It doesn't mean they're more special. It just means that they know for sure that they know more about the traffic situation that the child does. It's certain for them. And therefore they act if they're in that position to act. So I'm suggesting that a remarkable leader 
Now, a remarkable leader may not desire leadership or, or the position of leadership. They may not desire to be elected. But nevertheless, they do know that they know more than the masses do. They see clearly that they see more clearly than the masses do. Um, so let's say that there is such a remarkable leader or group of leaders. But the system is based on election. And there's no desire to turn it into dictatorship. But somehow also conventional democracy seems to fail us. And there's a need for remarkable leadership by many, let's say, but or to simplify, let's say by by one, or one group of people. How does one, how does a group that doesn't have the ability of remarkable leadership, how does it recognize the remarkable leader? Because they're going to be different, they're going to see different, they're going to see different ways, because if they saw the same way, that the uh, non remarkable group of leaders saw things, if the non remarkable group of leaders saw it the same way, and saw in the same ways and manners, and saw the same things as that remarkable leader saw, then they would already be in the realization of that civilization or that architecture of their society. So by definition, again, like, how do you solve this problem? How do you elect someone that you don't recognize as being the right leader? I invite all the viewers to kind of uh, try to solve this paradox in the comment section or whatever. It'll be entertaining to read. I would love to read that. But of course, this applies to many situations. It's just, it's a hypothetical in this case, but it's also a real life scenario. Yeah. In businesses, organizations, uh, families, communities, and ultimately even like presidency and, and royalty and all that stuff. Because I think many people will agree that it's not that classical democracy, although its principle is quite beautiful and sane, it doesn't tend to produce the quantum leap in in true, a truly beneficial civilization for all, or it hasn't so far anyway. And I think a lot of people will agree that classical dictatorship is not the way to go either. Right. You can, again, look up the history book. So what is a different kind of structure? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, for me, this comes back to, okay, what would the civilization need to truly excel to truly take that quantum leap that is in the benefit in the best interest of all, which may, which may mean that for a certain period of time, there are certain sacrifices that are made in certain individuals or groups or whatever, but somehow, because you can't do it without that, like you cannot um, attain the benefit of all without everyone in a sense, trusting that process and accepting that process. Let's say that hypothetically, and I think this is quite realistic, that the civilization, if it wants to make a, a change, that somehow it needs to accept a new form of leadership. Mm. I, I think this whole sort of trend of not having any leadership is also detrimental. Mm. Because, well, well, quite frankly, I just don't think like flat people are ready. Um, flat organizations? Where there's just where it's like called? hierarchical lists without hier hierarchy. I'd be curious to see how they operate. But any type of experience I've been a part of where it was that way, it was just a shit show. Like groups yeah. or sessions or things like, oh, let's, uh, let's, let's all sit in a circle, because it <laughs> mm -hmm. sounds really cool and nice and equal and even and nothing would be produced. That was a benefit to all. Right. It was yeah. just like every individual taking up space from their own bubble and saying their little thing and their little opinion, and it would literally not go anywhere. That's been my experience with that, but maybe there's been better prototypes, I don't know. So I do believe in leadership, and I don't, I don't think leadership is an evil thing inherently. I don't think hierarchy, when it comes to organizational structure, is an evil thing. I think hierarchy is a helpful thing, mm -hmm. as long as we can separate the notion, and again, this is where sort of our low self-esteem and our low self-conditioning comes in, as we grow up as human beings, we're taught that we have low self-esteem, that we are unworthy, that we're not good enough, that we should be like this, we should be like that, da, da, da. So if you have a lot of people in a group that have low self-esteem and that are insecure, they're going to combine two, two concepts that are actually separate concepts. So they're going to take hierarchy, 
which is inherently free of uh, tyranny. Hierarchy doesn't inherently mean tyranny, suppression, opposition, um, none of that. It doesn't mean that inherently. There's hierarchy in all kinds of things, and, and it operates. So there's one concept, which is hierarchy, or in this case, leadership. And then there's the concept of equality, or worthiness, or value or validity, validity of the soul, validity of that entity. So if I combine these two topics, because I'm insecure, because I have low self esteem, now I'm going to want to fight against mm. the concept of hierarchy, even when that hierarchy might be actually in the benefit of all, even in the benefit of myself, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes hierarchy is not productive, uh, totally granted. So it depends on the situation. It depends on whoever is in that position of hierarchy. But hierarchy itself is not a negative phenomenon. It's inherently free of being a tyranny. It could be used to turn into tyr uh, tyranny of some kind. But it by itself, it's not, is what I'm saying. The concept of hierarchy is not by itself a tyranny till you introduce human beings with selfish intention, which is a different topic, right. right? But so there's then hierarchies. And then there is the topic of low self esteem, which projects itself as a need for equality, and evenness and, and that we're all the same. And therefore, hierarchy seems like a tyranny or like an inherently negative thing. Because if your goal is to try to externally prove your equality, then of course, any structure that you meet that has some kind of a hierarchy will seem like evil even if some of them work in your favor, but you will still try to tear it all down because, hmm. because you've uh, collapsed two concepts into one concept. In your mind, it's now one concept. Hierarchy means inequality. It doesn't. It, hierarchy does not mean inequality. Inequality means inequality. Hierarchy means hierarchy. Hierarchy is an organizational structure that um, oftentimes can work really well, and oftentimes is even needed, otherwise nothing will work. There's hierarchy in all kinds of things. So first of all, we have to sort of uh, filter out our mixed up concepts, and see every concept for what it really is, in this case, equality, and hierarchy. And then the other topic would be worthy leadership, yes or no, like the human element to it, like, who is it that would make use of this hierarchy, who is higher up in the hierarchy of some kind of an organizational system, let's say like a political system or a leadership system, or architect architecture of leadership, let's say that there's a top, uh, that there's a top entity or group of entities that are at the top of the hierarchy. Again, how do you like that? if you cannot recognize their leadership capacities, because if you could, you would have it and you wouldn't need them. Good luck. Mm -hmm. And then again, the second paradox is, let's say that somehow we were, we passed that puzzle, and we solved that puzzle, we're past that problem. And we managed to successfully elect and recognize somehow by some maybe test or whatever it was, we are now able to and we have elected, therefore, the proper virtuous, remarkable leaders, and are doing a great job. Now, second paradox is, I still cannot recognize what the leader recognizes, that's why they are the leader. And I've accepted that. And it's been very beneficial for everybody. It's been working out for years now. But how do you ensure now that they have that power, if you will, now that they are elected, and I do not have the ability to recognize, uh, at least not in the early stages, when that leader kind of uh, goes off course or loses their right mind or loses their ability to be that remarkable leader. What type of failsafe system, law, formula, test, whatever it is, would ensure that someone whose qualities I cannot understand, how do you create a test? to prove that someone who sees more than you do, how can you determine if they fail the test or succeed the test? But I think that would be, that would be a great, if we could figure it out, I think that would be a great uh, leadership type of architecture to have, 
to somehow elect those leaders that actually see clearer, have better vision on all kinds of levels and skills and qualities than we do, elect them, and somehow have a system in place that would be able to recognize something we can't recognize, so that when they are, of course, and this is a in, this would be an interim or a intermediate kind of architecture, because ultimately, in a true deliberate utopia, where everyone is completely in its own integrity and honesty, this type of uh, leadership wouldn't even be needed. Mm -hmm. And if there was some kind of need for leadership, then there'd be total transparency and ability to recognize if something is off or not. But if we're talking about a civilization that's not yet, so to speak, fully telepathic and transparent and self honest and honest with each other, and it lacks a lot of these capacities to see beyond the service and see beyond the words and the labels and the obvious and the taboos and all that. Like anyone who can't see beyond words and labels and taboos cannot be a good leader per definition. They're so easily swayed by words and labels and taboos and this. So the good leader, again, will seem paradoxical, will seem contradictive at times by its very nature, because it dances around with the concepts that other people are stuck by and uh, blindsided by. So again, how do we like that? That is only a situation to potentially evolve into for a period of time until more ideally, a civilization is able to be completely transparent with itself and its other portions. And therefore, that would be sort of like what we would call a telepathy, if you will, amongst each other, it'd be just such transparency and honesty and, and sensitivity and empathy that um, there wouldn't be a need to, there would just be clarity if someone's no longer able to be in that leadership mm -hmm. position. And there may not even be a need for that type of leadership anymore, ultimately, because then truly we are self leaders if everybody is more quote unquote, enlightened and has uh, seen beyond their bubble, then they become more able to lead themselves, there's much less need for leadership in order to generate benefit for all. But before we're in that case, if everybody's still running around in their dense uh, mental filters and bubbles and tunnel vision, imagine no leadership whatsoever, just total anarchy or not even anarchy, just like a flat society, or like where <laughs> there's no direction. And like everyone's just kind of shouting whatever they believe, and just uh, sharing their opinion. And that's about it. There wouldn't, not much would happen. One could argue maybe not much has to happen, but mm -hmm. I think it, there'd just be a lot of confusion and stagnation, and not a lot of benefit for all would be generated until people grow beyond that bubble of their own thinking, and can truly start to peer into the unity of a people and see beyond the taboos and see beyond the service levels and see beyond the definitions and see beyond the labels and the names and the words and the language and the differences in the skin color and what have you, and see beyond the mental traps and the social traps. For now, I think we still do need that, if we wish to excel at a rate that would uh, save us from extinction, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. But then again, the paradox. Well, it's good that there's all these mini formats for people to practice leadership, like companies, so people can actually get a track record. Like, it's not that nice. out of nowhere, you just have to hope you get like the red carpet rolled out for you if you're this special leader. It's actually like we get to practice either privately or as like a mayor or of on these smaller scales, we can cool. yeah. prove like the concept. Mm -hmm. I feel we could talk a little bit more about, because as we evolve, the leadership structure is going to need to evolve. So I kind of see, like initially for us to lead ourselves out of this potential for extension, we probably do need this model of this remarkable leader. But I feel as we evolve, we could have more of a, like a structure that does have circles, but the circles have ascending hierarchies. So it's like on the lower level, there there may be like small pods of individuals, and then maybe they have their leader, which informs like the next tier of leaders, so to speak, and then it kind of goes up. Um, and then near the top, there's 
maybe there's still that remarkable leader, but one tier down, there's like a remarkable, say, council. And because I do feel with a more remarkable leader, they have, there's so many qualities to a remarkable leader, right? There's the ability to communicate, the ability to be a visionary synthesizer. There's so many different aspects. And I feel if we can identify which aspects of a leader that the civilization needs to evolve, then maybe this doesn't have to be just within one person. It could be within a group of beings. And maybe that remarkable leader could be the representative, but they may not necessarily have to embody all of the qualities that the civilization needs to move itself forward. So as we we do evolve and everyone takes more ownership for their own remarkable aspects and gifts, then I do feel that then there won't be such a, an emphasis on that one leader. But I do feel that the structure should be under consistent, not consistent, but we'll need to evolve as we evolve. Like this structure will need to reflect the level of evolution that humanity goes through. Cool. So you really haven't answered those questions for yourself? No, I just, I wrote them down a year ago. I haven't really thought of them since. So I would have to, I would have to sit with it and uh, really tune in. I'm sure there's multiple ways you could try to structure it. And I'm sure you're not the first person to think of it. I mean, I'm sure right? this is yeah. like a, yeah, I'm sure this is a real philosophical topic that people have considered. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect ancient Greece. Like it sounds reason. like a stoic, uh, yeah, a stoic problem. Yeah. So any, any finishing thoughts on leadership itself? My favorite example is capitalism. I think uh, it's like a meritocracy, essentially, like companies that are led by the most competent leaders thrive in the market. So, yeah. I think just just putting leadership, many leadership structures like companies into the market to compete with each other and filter out the others. It's just that just because someone can lead a company or is a marketing whiz or knows how to play that game, commercial game, does that provide that being with the merits to lead a civilization in its best interest? in its own best interest, meaning the best interest of the civilization as a whole. Because it is a competitive atmosphere to demonstrate worthy leadership. When true leadership, when it comes to the benefit of all, requires uh, unity instead of com competition. I totally agree that, that the skills and qualities required to be able to compete do demonstrate at least to some extent, in some dimensions, uh, an ability to lead. So nothing wrong with competition at all. And it does sort of allow quality, skill, talent, vision, and so forth, leadership qualities to shine forth. But is it the best? Is it the best test for someone who then needs to selflessly lead mm -hmm. um, an entire civilization? And it can be, but it also often probably isn't. Right. Yeah. The issue with that, with uh, companies is that it, you have to grow, like continuously grow and make profit where that wouldn't be the goal of say a town mayor or a governor, right? It's not about continual increasing profits. It's actually just about the well-being of your community. So maybe that's a better example. Yeah, and actually, we have a good example now with Trump, uh, who's basically a business leader, right. business person, and he's in office, right? So, and I think in that realm, he's doing a good job uh, in terms of like from that type of consciousness and that type of um, atmosphere, atmosphere, in terms of. Uh, competition and like seeing the nation as a company, making the company strong, making the companies thrive and so forth. 
Um, however, when we're talking about the world as a single civilization, who are you going to compete against or with? And who are you going to grow in comparison to? And who is going to get filtered out if what you're governing is an entire civilization as one? If there's only one company in the whole world, then where does that mindset come in? But how do we get there from here? Like some well, leaders a, have to rise a, to the surface. That's a different question, yeah. How do we get to a unified civilization? That's what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And at that point, would we even oh. still have the one leadership model if we were a unified civilization? Right. Uh, we probably would, actually. There would probably be some leadership model, some governing body still, some oh, administrative body, some council, some leadership, some elected officials, what have you. I think to not have it, that is, uh, is probably unrealistic, like almost in any stage of advancement. I think it serves a practical purpose. Mm -hmm. We've just not done it that well for the most part. So yeah, that's a, it's a different question. How do we get to a unified civilization? that then would still have its own leadership structure, probably, but it would be benign and transparent and holistic, and it would match that civilization, because there'd only be one company on the whole planet for that whole species. So that would simply be a council or whatever that represents the people in all fairness and transparency and honesty, because there's no reason or need or desire anymore to uh, put someone above someone else, right? Or to profit at the expense of others or... Mm that would have all been sort of soft in the consciousness. So the question, how do we even get to that place from where we are right now? And you said, like, doesn't that require strong individual leaders or countries? Is that what you said? Well, we just need to bring these leaders to the surface. Like, otherwise, otherwise, how do we even but, find these people? But which leaders? So the, the capitalists? The remarkable The leaders. remarkable leaders. Yeah. So is... Is uh, Steve Jobs a remarkable leader for the civilization or for a nation? Probably not. Is uh, Trump, you know? No, I don't think so. Well, I, I guess it depends on what the aim is, right? Are we talking about doing it the way we've done things so far and seeing nations as, as uh, individual companies almost? Then they probably would be quite skilled at it. And therefore the capitalistic system would be a fairly good test to see who rises to the top and is able to, or at least can demonstrate that they're able to consistently lead remarkable results over a long period of time in a competitive environment and a um, supply and demand based environment and so forth. Um, but if the intention is how do we bridge our current system of separation and division and borders and countries and nations, how do we bridge it from there to really ar arriving at a heartfelt sense of unity among all beings and all nations, uh, and ultimately even to not have the nations, but not in terms of like the, what the one, um, the, uh, what's it called? The, uh, the new world order, right? Mm. They're also oh, right. kind of trying to, make it all one thing, but um, that's not the type of unity that I'm speaking of. So how to get to that unity consciousness? And is the way to it really the individual leaders of individual companies, individual nations, as we have been kind of doing it? And if not, then what is required? How do we get there? How do we get to a position where we could even consider having a unified civilization with a unified leadership? that actually transparently and honestly represents the benefit of all. Mm. What is in between now and that? Now and that now. Mm. Well, maybe in a, in sort of a similar light to the capitalism, it's actually the way these people are sort of rising up with their private followings. So actually people are getting practice leading, not a company, but just, um, like how Joe Rogan is just building this massive following of people who are being benefited by 
his balance or his wisdom or his humor or whatever. But there's pockets of this sort of self-made nations or that may just grow over time. But yeah, I don't see how any of it will lead to a unified civilization. Yet. No. Not yet. Not with any, not, not with not any, any existing Not model. any of that, but what do you feel is leading towards that? Well, I feel like we actually are le- going in the direction of a unified civilization. So just as people become wiser in general, mm-hmm. um, individually. Nice. And how do they become wiser individually? Go through all the stuff that they're going through. With examples too, with, you know, p- occasional uh, mirrors and examples and people to expedite the process. Right. So basically educational yes. would expedite it. Yeah. So the education of the individual man and woman and child. So again, that's why the part of the reason why I do what I do is because I actually, or focus on what I focus my energies on is because I believe that at the heart of this transformation as we need it right now is spiritual education, spiritual knowledge, self-knowledge, where education, classical education is education about stuff and objects and data and knowledge, which has its place in its time and its relevance. But it doesn't transform a civilization at its core because it doesn't deal with the biases and the belief systems and the emotions and the misguided actions and the lack of um, the courage to face certain thoughts and emotions and feelings and how to... uh, integrate them and heal them and transcend them and how to operate from a higher level of consciousness and so forth. So the only way we're going to establish a unified civilization, which then would be open for true leadership to be elected through almost telepathic means, because it'd be so transparent and so obvious. And there would be no more deceit, no more intent to deceit. But that's, I mean, we're not there yet in this now, right? Um, There's another now, which we are there. And that's what we're bridging and teleporting to, if you will. But um, I believe the transformation in consciousness is required first before transformation in leadership architecture can take place and be successful. Um, mm. And that's second, it's secondary anyway. The leadership architecture is secondary to the transformation of man, woman, and child, or the individual, in other words. So I think spiritual education education about self, self self-knowledge, how to gather self-knowledge, how to accumulate self-knowledge, how to um, penetrate into the layers of the self, how to master oneself, and how to discover what's true, what's not true about oneself, and how to balance all that. I think that's the only way that we can have sort of a grassroots, hard awakening based movement, if you will, of education, where people from the ground up are different. They radiate something different. They expect something different. They recognize what's true, what's not true, much clearer. They recognize what's beneficial and benign and what's not benevolent. Amen. Mm. So think spiritual education of the individual at large, in large numbers. More than large. More than large. Yeah. Total numbers is what is required to, uh, to even get to a place where a new system of leadership would be a relevant discussion, perhaps. That's so cool to think about spiritual education as a political solution, just on a really practical level. Hmm. I feel we will evolve away from using the term spiritual as well. And it won't even be about it being education and spiritual education. It will just be education. Well, then eventually we'll evolve beyond it being education. It will just be so primary to the way of being. Nice. Mm-hmm. I agree. But yeah, Earth's education right now is for human doings, not human beings. Human what? Human doings. Nice, yes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> like, it's teaching us how to do and how to do everything in the world as opposed to how to be. Good bumper sticker, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true it's such a common one like i'm not a human doing i'm a human being but it's it's really true mm-hmm. it's a great bumper sticker it's a bumper sticker for a reason <laughs> we don't make shitty bumper stickers yeah so to me like it's kind of like we're 
nature right now and the political at atmosphere and the catalysts that people are producing for themselves out there at the external level, which of course reverberates in the thoughts and the emotions of the whole collective of the species, civilization. It's like that is working in tandem with those who are trying to bring forth spiritual education. We're making available this type of education, this type of information, this, these types of tools and understandings, we're making it available and accessible so that each individual can independently realize more of who they truly are, what's true, and how things truly operate energetically, uh, spiritually, metaphysically, on an everyday, day-to-day -day basis, and how to make that tangible, a lived reality how to free ourselves from our own thoughts and our own pain cycles and our own blame and shame and emotions and victimization and how to empower ourselves, free ourselves, live our calling from this empowered place of uh, knowing why we're here and, and living that purpose and knowing that eternal part of ourselves that never changes, that never dies, that never is born, that's always present, all that stuff. So we're making this available as are many others right now. And it's kind of like that effort to make that education available um, is being aided and assisted in tandem. It's working in tandem with sort of the uh, um, from earth catastrophes type of things to the whole socio political environment and the economics and everything that's kind of starting to burn down in the pandemic and stuff. Mm -hmm. The forced retreat for like three, four months. Mm -hmm. It's all pushing people to ask different questions. So, in that sense, there is quite a bit of hope from that perspective, <laughs> for this timeline of humanity. Mm -hmm. I think the sharp, the wake and shake is necessary. We've been in a very deep slumber. Yeah, it's like we're over here on this side, like, do you want to wake up? And then Mother Nature and politics and like pandemics and, and the media is over there saying, you want us to shake you up? So it's like, they're being like sandwiched nice. between the shaking up and the waking up. <laughs> you don't want to wake up? Okay, go over there. <laughs> Okay, I want to wake up. Okay. Are you sure? If you really want to wake up, you got to look at this and that, and you got to admit this about yourself and wow. become really humble. Then, okay, never mind. I don't want to wake up. Okay, bye. See you in a few minutes. Ah, okay, I want to wake up. I want to wake up. So, like, it's kind of pushing the civilization to the brink of its own, like, insanity with the potential to pop out into sort of a really inspiring flow of epic. collective awakening. And it's going to split up. Not everyone's going to take the awakening, even when they're being sh mm -hmm. shook up violently. They're still going to insist. They're still not going to know any better. They're still not going to want a change. And it's going to be tough for them for the most part. And then there's those who will shift more effortlessly, more willingly into this new stream of consciousness, this next level consciousness, this unified civilization, ultimately, what that will lead into is a unified civilization. So there is hope after all. Cool. It is cool. That's actually so cool. That feels like exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. It is. It is exactly what is happening. Yeah. It is actually what's happening. Yeah. I don't think there's any better explanation for what's happening right oh, now. I love that. It actually reminds me of of like when I first uh, ran into your teachings. I was like in a super activist phase in my life, and it that it felt exactly like but just so oppositional activists about everything, which there's merit to, but it's just, I just remember being like, I don't know if this is the way before I, before I found you or before I was even like what I would call spiritually oriented or interested. It was about a year of this and just a few, I would just run into things or like it would get taken too far. Mm -hmm. Not, in any obvious ways, but it was just like, oh, I could kind of see where this would keep going if I stayed this track. And it's like, I think this is the wrong way, but I wasn't sure exactly what the alternative was. So, but it just, it was like, had me keep like looking, looking around, like, hang on, what are the options? Like, what are the alternatives to this? Cause I'm pretty, this feels like the right thing. Like it's righteous and people are saying like, this is the way to make the changes I think need to be made in the world. And I, I'm pretty sure this is the way to do it. There's like a lot of momentum in this direction. We're like out in the streets protesting and, but I feel like there might be something wrong here. And then, yeah, it was, it was exactly that, like ping ponging back and forth between 
resistance and waking up or shaking, shaking up and waking up. I love that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. In order to be righteous, you got to have it wrong, no? So uh, to kind of give people some homework again, I'd say uh, it'd be great to ponder this paradox of how to elect leadership when that leadership is out of your own league but you want to elect that leadership because you know you're in need of some type of leadership that sees certain situations and that sees the trajectory of, uh, of your situation better than you do. But how do you recognize such a leader? Um, because if you can recognize them, then almost by definition, uh, they may not be seeing that much farther than you see. Uh, so kind of feel into that paradox and let us know if you come up with any solutions. And uh, you can consider this like the problem on the board of uh, Goodwill Hunting University. And uh, let's see who <laughs> solves the paradox. And the second paradox then being, let's say that hypothetically we are able to elect the remarkable leader that somehow whose vision and ability transcends our own ability to recognize solutions to problems and the approaches to them. Um, let's say that we have elected that entity or group of entities then how to ensure when we can't recognize where everything comes from, what they're doing and why they're doing everything they're doing, because again, that's why they are the remarkable leaders. How to somehow, while we're still in the civilization that has a lot of polarity and right and wrong and like selfish versus selfless, how to ensure that once they are in leadership, that they are recognize when they go sort of off course or when they lose their alignment uh, to their ability to be those truly remarkable leaders. Uh, very curious to hear your thoughts on this. So in the comment section in YouTube, if, you, if you're not watching this on YouTube, if you're not listening to this on YouTube, I recommend you just go to YouTube and leave your comments there and uh, see what you come up with. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Mirror Talks podcast with Bentinho Massaro. If you love these teachings and you want full access to almost all of Bentinho's recorded material, go to bentinhomassaro.tv. Right now, we're offering a free seven-day trial with unlimited access to everything on bentinhomassaro.tv, including curated playlists, guided meditations, and much more. This is our number one recommendation for you. As a subscriber, you'll get first access to these podcast episodes two weeks before they go public. You'll also get access to exclusive Q&As with Bentinho and other content only available to subscribers of BentinhoMassaro.tv. Also, Bentinho recently created a free online global enlightenment retreat. It's eight long-form sessions that coherently guide you through the foundation of his enlightenment teachings. You can watch the free online global enlightenment retreat at BentinhoMassaro.tv or on YouTube. If you're interested in the most current and complete overview of Bentinho's work to date, this is where we recommend you start. Another great resource is Trinfinity Academy, Bentinho's free online school for enlightenment, empowerment, and infinity. Each class is concise and clear and distills one key topic at a time, including homework. We strongly recommend you check out Trinfinity Academy if you want to master the mechanics of Bentinho's teachings. Finally, don't underestimate the value of sharing this episode with the people who came to mind as you were watching or listening. It's a service to them and the collective, and it's also the best thing you can do to support us in getting this message far and wide. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and leave positive reviews and ratings on your preferred platforms, and follow Bentinho on social media, especially Instagram. Thank you 